Our speaker today, Pete Melby, who is joined by his wife Cindy today uh, to present to us. Uh, Pete taught landscape architecture at Mississippi State for 35 years. Uh, as part of his classes, he worked on coastal edge projects creating natural beaches in Harrison County and worked towards restoring the salt marshes which once lined the beachfront. For their work on the Mississippi coast, um, Pete and a bioengineering professor by the name of Cathcart were awarded the Gulf Guarding Award by the EPA. In 1918, he was named Conservationist of the Year by the Daughters of the American Revolution. 1918? Uh, 2018, thank you. Thank you for your old feet. His new book. <laughs> uh, critics are wonderful. His new book, Third in Line, is a novel of high stakes eco intrigue, restoration of coastal edges and returning brackish waters to the Mississippi Sound will bring back their once abundant production in seafood. A, as the book reviewer, Candace Cox Wheeler with USA Today Network said the Mississippi Clarion Legend newspaper, by the time you finish this novel, you will find yourself so immersed in your surroundings, you will identify with the character who said, we flew with the pelicans, and waded in the shallow marshes with the blue heron. Regardless of our feelings toward nature and one another, it enables us to have a high regard for each other and for the wild landscapes and their inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So Pete's going to be available afterwards. He not only writes, uh, but he also illustrates. And as you can see here, he's, he's a wonderful writer and a wonderful illustrator. And so he's got those cards and, of course, books available to you. So Pete, thank you very much. Welcome to the Historical School. Thank you, Jim. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Um, our 35 years working on the coast, I've got 15 slides to cover it. So, and then I want to do a reading from third in line, and uh, so we'll just jump right in. Um, it's interesting, this landscape you live on, live within here, is dependent upon healthy landscapes, healthy, healthy ecosystems. Could you use the microphone? Some of the people cannot hear you. Okay. Is this one? Okay, um, can I just move it over? Yeah, sure. All right. So basically, people, ah, I can hear myself now. Uh, be, people are dependent, this area is dependent on healthy ecosystems. And if you just look at just a little bit of variety that you've got here, it's no wonder people all want to come to the coast and uh, enjoy the amenities down here. So when we were first starting at Mississippi State, uh, we were invited down by Tommy Munro and Judy Steckler, and uh, we wanted to work with the beach, and they wanted us to. And so the students, first of all, thought, wow, a heavy seawall and then sand and nothing else, and that needed to change. And uh, there was then the idea that, okay, we can break it up a little bit with something green, but not too much, because this needs to look as neat as our backyard. And they did allow us to plant dunes and introduce sea oats uh, and bring in some cabbage palms and some native plants, and it began to make the beach more comfortable for people to be there. But interestingly, the beach, when it had native plants, stayed in place more. And that was a big deal because every eight years, the little red area there, Harrison County is having to redo their beach at $11 million. And it blows away and washes away. And the main reason is there's no native plants on the beach. So uh, another cost, 30000 a year to sweep the sand off the highway. The sand blows across the barren beach, up the seawall, and onto Highway 90. 
and then three million a year for the sand beach department to take their heavy equipment out there and rake the beach and uh, that's a real issue because that compacts the sand water doesn't drain into the sand and any rainfall then washes it into the Mississippi Sound. So we worked with them on all of that and uh, they were okay with it. You know, it's a slow take. Uh, everybody wanted it to be neat like their backyard. The next thing we looked at were salt marshes. The, the beachfront used to have salt marshes. If you look at the old paintings by William Woodward and the old photographs, there were salt marshes. Uh, intermittent up and down the beach. So we figured out how to grow salt marshes. We used, we developed these, uh, we took erosion control netting, wrapped it up, put it in there to break the waves, and then that enabled the salt marsh grasses to establish behind there. And it, it didn't take long until the uh, people were attracted to the areas that had the green marsh plants, the uh, people with the Sand Beach Department said uh, during high tide they could catch the fire out of flounder between the salt marsh and the, uh, the sand. And you look at the incoming waves and see how the beach was not being eroded and instead the, wherever we had salt marshes the beach was wider. Um, that was exciting for us. Now we found when we, this is at the, the, uh, the uh, Schooner Pier, if we tried to put the salt marsh grasses on the land and let it walk in there, they would not do that. That's the weirdest thing. If we took and planted them in the water, they had no problem and they flourished and went out into the water and uh, helped to hold the sand and create more beach. So the next thing we went to Deer Island and we did that in three or four places there and we're having good luck and then uh, we both retired and the money ran out and, uh, but uh, the plants live on. So it's sort of like some of these elaborate sand sculptures. They're beautiful. The beach, after they, they rake it and make it look good, is beautiful but it washes away and it is, you've got to have a natural beach uh, to hold that sand and uh, that's uh, an issue. So I wanted to share that with you and now I want to tell you about this. Then Victor Maver over in, oh I can put this in here I'll bet, in Biloxi has been a proponent of bringing back the seafood to when Biloxi and the coast was the seafood capital of the world. And that's been a real challenge because things have happened like what we just saw. We lost our salt marshes and um, we had water wars with Louisiana and the uh, water in the Pearl River was diver diverted to the Louisiana side in 1918 and it flowed from there to the Gulf of Mexico instead of through the Mississippi Sound. You know the solutions according to the, the uh, scientists are, are there, they're very obvious but we've got the politics, always the politics to deal with. And so that stimulated this book. Mr. Maver died not too long ago and he, oh he just worked really hard to, to bring back uh, the oysters. So we, while he was alive though, we did bring back the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation scientists with the DMR people and they were talking over the table and there was some promise that things could happen to bring Louisiana and Mississippi back together. and. Um, but that didn't last, but at least the seed is planted. So I decided, well, my last resort is to write this book, Third in Line. I'm not gonna tell you what Third in Line means. You'll have to read it, but I'm gonna, if I have Chris just a 
about five minutes. I do have five oh, minutes, right don't ahead. I? Okay, I'm watching my time. Dr. Codling said uh, they start throwing things if you, if you go over your time, but the, I don't see that in this crowd. So, uh, so this is chapter two, um, traveling with her husband, Jim, and their family to the Louisiana and Mississippi coast would be an opportunity to see and experience up close the successes in the region in which she had intimately been involved. She is Penny Chatham, and she's a representative in Congress from Mississippi. Achievements in the three years have been so exceptional that they were being featured on regional news programs. She, she plays her cards and she becomes Speaker of the House. And in the acknowledgments in my book, I talk about strong women. And I think from what I've seen, mothers from the South are strong. They had to be strong for a variety of reasons. So she's a strong lady. The speaker had been hearing and reading about the increase in seafood production and the respect of participants from both sides of the Honey Island Swamp towards one another. Writer Danny Brunt explained how major increases in oyster and shrimp production had evolved for two significant reasons. Seasonal Mississippi River flood water was now being diverted through the Atchafalaya River Basin instead of through the delicately balanced waters in the Mississippi Sound. Additional fresh water from the Pearl River at one time, and she brought it back, helped to restore salinity cycles in the Mississippi Sound. The resulting brackish water cycles fluctuated between eight and 13 parts salt per thousand parts of fresh water. This ideal range of saltiness required by oysters discourages a pathogen named dermo, which moves in and kills oysters when salinity falls below eight parts per 1,000 parts fresh water. Similarly, the oyster drill, I've got a sketch of the oyster drill over there, a carnivorous snail can move into a reef when the salinity increases above 14 parts salt per thousand parts fresh water and consume all of its waters, uh, all of its oysters. And that's why we don't have any oysters. Unnatural extreme swings in salinity had been caused by too much flood water in the spring and not enough fresh water from the Pearl River in the summer and fall. Without the right saltiness in the estuary's brackish water, the ecosystem lost its balance, causing the loss of all of its wild oysters. And if you look at the statistics, this is true, the decline of shrimp and blue crab harvests. Changing, switching to a later chapter, um, from his kayak, 10-year-old, Andrew Reardon, she brings her, her family on this trip from Congress to, to look at your region down here. In fact, they even come through Bay St. Louis and have some experiences. Uh, he issued an ultimatum for the flotilla to pick a spot uh, on the idyllic shores for what he was calling an absolutely essential pause for an up-close inspection of the ecology. He kindly but persistently had been hounding river keeper Hannah Thomas about taking a shore break because they needed to get some driftwood and make a brief nature call, but not necessarily in that order. She was fine with taking photos in the ecology pause, but reminded Andrew he was in a kayak and she was curious where he was gonna, where, was, where he was going to put any keepsake driftwood he found. He said that if Brent and his men, these are Capitol Police guards that traveled with the speaker, could put big game rifles in their kayaks, he could probably stash some driftwood somewhere in the one he and Pop were using. As the flotilla of seven kayaks quietly and cautiously glided toward an opening in the salt marsh grasses, this is actually on 
um, what's the island we went to? Cat Island, yeah. Would take them to their rest stop. Hannah Thomas abruptly whispered in a forbidding and guttural tone, pull your, batter, pull your paddles above water now and stop moving, freeze where you are. Her threatening warning caused the gliding flotilla to stop all movement wondering why and what was wrong. Up ahead, the travelers saw a dark shape, clearly making a move from the sea oats covered sand spit to open waters, sliding between loosely spaced clumps of stiff salt marsh grasses. The dark object was the width of a 30-year-old pine tree. It had the texture of a longleaf pine. Once it reached knee-deep water, the 13-foot long gliding tree trunk-like object was a few yards beyond the front of Hannah Thomas and the speaker, the speaker's kayak. Hannah shouted, sister, this was a daughter, drop your paddle and pull your arms inside the kayak. Speaker Padham, Seeker Chatham, Speaker Chatham. Drop your paddle, don't move, hold tightly to the edges of your cockpit. Before reaching the shallow draft kayaks, it dropped beneath the water's surface, picked up speed, barely clearing the bottom of the vulnerable kayaks floating above its prehistoric body. At the same time, she reached inside, Hannah Thomas reached inside her kayak, pulled out an 18 inch long knife with a pointed blade that she had duct taped to the underside of the hull of her cockpit. The three security guards pulled out their 45 caliber, calendar caliber handguns and held them pointed upward in case they would need them should the large alligator capsize one of the kayaks and attack one of the occupants. Because of the restrained motion of the flotilla and because of the number of kayaks, the prehistoric lizard-like reptile vanished without incident in the depths of the tannin colored water in the marsh pool. The swirl created by such a large creature in the shallow water caused the lightweight and shallow draft kayaks to move and bump into one another. Hannah Thomas directed the flotilla to say, stay close to one another and beach their craft together on the sandy shoreline. The armed Capitol Police agents got out first to make sure everything was safe. Once securely on shore for their ecology break, the group carefully explored the sand, sand spit, sandy spit and dunes in small groups for safety. It's got a lot of drama in it. It's got some science in it. It's your future. If we can bring back oysters and not let the shrimp and blue crab harvest diminish because of the issues that are discussed in here. So it's third in line. I appreciate Chris being able to talk with y'all and share this with you. Thank you. Uh, I got it. <laughs> Pete, I've got one question. And it seems to be an irreconcilable difference in the building up of the marsh. The popular opinion is we have to have more fresh water, divert water out the river to get the sediments in to build the marsh back up. As a result of all that fresh water, what you cite in your book, of course, happens to the seafood industry has right. an adverse effect on that. So how do, how do we achieve protection of the coast and grow these salt marshes and do all that and at the same time maintain our fisheries? And you, you only have an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, we built salt marshes that were 30 feet wide based on what used to be here 10, 15 years ago. That's when we first created our salt marshes. So we didn't have to have a difference in water uh, to, to make that happen. And interestingly, Chris, salt marshes, the Spartina alternate flora emits a chemical it, through, a, tech, through a, a science technique called alleopathy 
And that chemical keeps uh, the uh, snails away from the salt marsh so the salt marsh is ha healthy. So salt marshes don't eat, get, get eaten by the, any of the snails. We also looked online and it was interesting because we didn't start having an issue with the flesh-eating bacteria according to the, the internet and citations we found there. It's not a scientific deduction because we didn't thoroughly search it, but we just looked. There were no, we didn't have the flesh-eating bacteria until the salt marshes were gone. And so maybe the alleopathy was also helping with the bacterial exchange. In terms of the water, uh, oysters have a certain range. They'll grow in, in salt water, 33 parts per thousand salt. But they won't flourish there. And their ideal range is 8 to 14. And until we can get the water cycling closer to what their natural habitat requires, we're not going to have oysters anymore. And uh, we can do that. We can work with the Pearl River. Of course, the Pearl River right now, they want to build another reservoir above the uh, Pearl River. And uh, a, f a former uh, shellfish scientist at DMR said, allowing all of these lakes north of us is affecting the water coming into the Mississippi Sound. And then in 1918, when Louisiana pushed to divert the, the pearl, the, according to what I've read online, the, the idea was Mississippi would get half the water and Louisiana would get half. Louisiana, Louisiana ended up getting over 70% worth. So we're, we've got things we've got to change. Yes, sir. What relationship is there between uh, channelization in the rivers, Mississippi River on up, the Corps of Engineers, levees, and so forth, and the destruction of the coastal areas, if any. Which rivers? Mississippi. Mississippi. Uh, any and all. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say, I would say there's an in impact, but I don't know what it would be. I do know that when they channel around the uh, barrier islands, you get a, a much greater, the scientists say, you get a much greater influx of fresh water, which has helped to uh, make the water cycle not what it should be. We, another scientist said we now have sh uh, sharks breeding in the Mississippi Sound because of the water salinity level, whereas we didn't used to have that happen. So. <coughs> Oh, Pete. Oh, go ahead. Excuse uh, me, Jim. Uh, this uh, concept of silt coming down the Mississippi River, uh, replenishing the marshes, uh, seems counterintuitive to the appearance of the mouth of the Mississippi River. It looks to me uh, like over the last 100 years, uh, much of that has evaporated or disappeared. Now, you would think if shunting water from the Mississippi River into, say, Barataria Bay was going to build up the marshes, that the marshes would have stayed built up at the mouth of the Mississippi River where there are five different channels and silt should be being deposited every day and yet that area is as much eroded yeah. or disappeared as any other. That, that's an interesting phenomena. And it could have to do with the wave action from the Gulf of Mexico at that level versus in the sound, in the Mississippi Sound, you've got a lot more protection from uh, coastal waves. D Mr. Malver, Victor Malver used to say that the oysters needed all the phytoplankton that had gone through the marshes and across the fields, the bacteria and, and the phytoplankton or little algae, and that was one of the food sources of oysters. And when they put the levees up in the rivers, and especially the Mississippi River, 
we no longer got that influx of phytoplankton into the Mississippi Sound. It's complicated, but it can be solved. The scientists have got to, like Lake Pontchartrain Basin people came to Mississippi and that was the last meeting, you know, that we need to get those two, DMR and Louisiana, thinking together. We all know Louisiana plays the high card. They, they have more people and more pull. And, uh, but they're losing out in terms of oysters as well. The Biloxi marshes, that the, there's not as much being harvested there as there once was.